Well, if you have your Bibles and want to open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that would be awesome. Last week was a fun week with Pastor Dave Pressure here. Uh, it was uh, interesting for me to see people come in and I was talking to a person and then somebody else walked by and they just like, Can I, oh, I haven't seen you so long, you know, and they were talking to each other and that happened over and over and over. So that was a lot of fun to see that. And before that though, we had, we had four Sundays uh, we had four Sundays where we talked about, uh, we talked about renovation, but the first Sunday we were talking about spiritual life. The second Sunday we were talking about hospitality or being more outward focused. The third Sunday was about generosity and the fourth Sunday was about family. And so the next four Sundays, beginning today, we're going to go back over those four same topics. Now, obviously not the same messages, but the same theme and direction. So this week, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 11, talking about our spiritual life and a focus on that. And then next week, we're going to be talking about hospitality, again, being an outward-focused church. And then the week after that, we will be uh, talking about generosity. And then after that, we're going to be back to the theme of family. And so that's going to be three weeks from today. I think it's, I think it's August the 19th. But I've got two guys that are going to be here that day. and They're going to join me on the platform. These two guys are coming together as co-pastors, and they're going to be planning a church with the Alliance in Kansas City. So these guys are, are just, I've hung around them a little bit, gotten to know them a little bit. They're a lot of fun. They've got a lot of energy. What I like best is they're coming out of this environment of a church in Council Bluffs and in Omaha. It's called City Light Church. Some of you have heard of City Light. Uh, I guess you've talked about it here before I came. Uh, but City Light has got just an interesting DNA and an interesting dynamic. And what they do is they plant, they try to plant other churches, but they plant with two leaders, two co-pastors. And what they look for, what they share with me is they look for a person with a passion for a place. But they really need two persons, right? Because they plant with co-pastors. So they've got two people with a passion for a place called Kansas City. Um, anyway, I asked those two guys to join us here because as we look into the future to try to work with our district churches to plant more churches throughout the Midwest, particularly within our Mid-America district, these are the kind of guys and these are the kind of circumstances that we want to come alongside of and collaborate with and support. And so they're going to be here three weeks from today. Um, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 17, uh, we are uh, a couple, couple weeks ago, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago or so, we were in a room talking about worship ministry and our worship services, and we were asking the question, what's confusing? And somebody said, somebody said communion is confusing, especially for new people. And it's a lot of times in our church. You know, we do communion and we just, we have communion and, and we do it and to somebody who just walks in, it might be really confusing. And so that day I said to myself, the next time we do communion, I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians 11, which is the, uh, one of the foundational passages on the Lord's Supper. And we're going to take a look at that passage because I think that, I, I don't know, I know I've never preached here, but there's truth in this passage that I didn't catch for years just going to church on Sundays and uh, listening to messages and going through, uh, going through communion. So two things here on the screen. The love feast, the love feast called by others, the Christ event, uh, the Lord's Supper, the, the common meal, was actually a meal that early believers shared. And it allowed for the breaking down of cultural barriers, and it placed everyone on equal footing in their desperate need for Jesus' body and blood. So in society and in our world, in our, in our culture, it's the same way. You've got these, these uh, hierarchies, right? You've got the haves and you've got the have-nots, and you've got everybody in between. And when we come to Jesus, all those, all those, uh, all those distinctions they all go like this, and they all go on the same, on the same level. That's why that phrase, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross, is so theologically true. Because at the foot of the cross, when we come to Jesus, all these distinctions that our culture places us in, and these groupings and hierarchies and systems that our culture has for us, they all get washed away. 
Because in Christ, we're one body. In Christ, we're, we're equal and we're even. The Corinthians, however, had allowed the cultural, the of the day dining experience to prevail even in the Lord's Supper, even in their common meal together, their love feast together, thus highlighting for some their social inequality and alienation. So a typical Roman home in Corinth would have, uh, uh, it's not like it is today. Like we go into our homes today and basically it's, it's our area, it's very private, and the only people that come in are those that we invite in. In fact, you know, a lot of homes have fences and gates and, and there's different levels and there's locks and there's, there's cameras that watch everything. But back then it was different. And back then they would have, they would have in the home uh, often a shop or two in the front of the home for stuff the family worked on and the family created. It was their business. And so they, they would have a shop in the front and then they would have servants in the home, even a middle income home. A Roman home in Corinth would have three, four, five, six servants or slaves. They would have quarters and live right in the home. And they would kind of have their spot. And they would have their spot. And then uh, the, the patron or the owner of the home, uh, the dad, the business owner and the, the family leader, he, you know, he would have his spot. And th- there were places in the home like that. And so what was happening is they would do the Lord's Supper. They would meet at somebody's home and they had these two different rooms where they would eat in. And the one room was for the old man, right? Maybe not so old, right? But the business guy, maybe the dad of the home and his friends, his, um, his well-to-do buddies, those who were on the upper echelon and, and they would kind of eat in this room over here. And then in, and this room was called, I gotta get, I think it was called the triclinium. You know why it was called the triclinium? I don't either. It wasn't important enough for me to figure out. But it was called the triclinium, and then there was another area called the atrium that was uh, often had like this small pool in the middle that would catch the rainwater, and it was out in like the courtyard. And, and when people would come for meals, the important people would eat in here. It was like this horseshoe-shaped table, and that's where like the good stuff was, right? That's where the good food was. That's where the good drink was. That's where it was happening. And out in the atrium were sometimes 30 or 40 others that were standing. So this was a standing meal. And there was some food around. And every once in a while, maybe some leftovers of the really good stuff would make its way out there if these people got full. And this was happening, this was happening during the Lord's Supper in the early church in the city of Corinth. So they were allowing the cultural separations, socioeconomic, social separations, economic separations, ethnic separations, they were allowing those to come into the body, into the church when they would meet together for the Lord's Supper. And Paul is saying, this is not good. So as we share in communion today, I was reminded of this, uh, I got a message, it was maybe eight weeks ago, I was, at, I was in Rochester, it was the weekend I helped my mom move into her uh, assisted living place. And uh, we were really, really busy, and I was sitting on my sister's deck, it was later at night, and I got this message from this kid named Brandon Patterson. He said he was a young pastor in Georgia. He said that he was uh, still in seminary a little over a year ago when two of his professors put his name in at this little Baptist church in Georgia. They put his name in and this church called him. He said, well, I'm still in seminary. They said, well, that's okay. We need a pastor. If you would come, it would be really helpful. So he, met, he went and he actually, he sent some material and they say, we come, we'd like to interview you. And he got there, he got to this little, this little town in Georgia and he went into the diner to have an interview with a deacon. The deacon's name was Jimmy Carter and the church is in Plains, Georgia. So President Carter's in this, in this thing and, and, and he interviewed and they end up calling him as the pastor. Little church, like 30 people. And so he was saying that when, as the pastor there, he's been there now a little over a year, he said when he first got there, the church was really divided. Small church, there'd been a lot of struggle, there'd been a lot of you know, leadership transition, a lot of hurt. And so, so he said in the evening services, they'd have like eight people show up. And these eight people, they would all come separately 
and they, and they wouldn't sit next to each other. And they wouldn't really talk together because there, there was so much dissension. And he said to me, um, well, we were talking, I said, I said, Brandon, how, what did you do? How did you deal with that in such a small church? And his answer really moved me. Now, this kid's kind of quirky. Um, if I think if, of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, the scriptures say, is like was nobody to behold, and he wasn't eloquent or anything, but he was powerful. And Brandon, over the course, so what I did, we have this podcast for pastors, right? And I, so I, I replied to Brandon. He had sent me an email and said, I listen to your podcast, it's really helpful. So I sent him an email back and I said, Brandon, you know, there's an interesting thing. We have a rule that any guys that are pastors of a small church who also have a former living president on their church board, they can be guests on our podcast. So we called them up and we talked. And as we talked, I said, you know, how did you bring this together? And uh, here's what he said to me, and I'm going to play it because it was really moving to me. And so what did you do to turn things around? I, I prayed and then I prayed. Um, no, so St. Catherine of Siena, St. Catherine of Siena once said, the human heart is always drawn to love. And I think as a leader, the number one thing you need to do is love. People take the identity of the leader they have, it, it, it somewhat. And so when I came there, I said, number one, I need to love them. This is a community that has not been loved and has not been cared for. Mm. I'm going to show them the love that they've needed. Then the second thing I did is I set communion as a priority. I said, at communion, you are a family. And so every night we, that we had church, we had communion. Always saying, here we are by Christ, bounded together in love. And then um, just a lot of meetings, a lot of crying with people, a lot of loving them and asking them for forgiveness. And I mean, now it's like I can't even start church on Sunday night because they're too busy laughing and joking with each other. And it's like it's just been incredible. So Brandon said, I remember listening to that. It was like a month and a half ago that we recorded with him. And he said that every, so every Sunday night, every Sunday night when they came together, they would have communion. And he would say to them, we're a family, and by Christ, through Christ, we're bounded together in love. And he said over the months, the weeks and the months, people started to come together. People started to uh, talk, and they started to share, and they started to open up. And uh, I, I really, really enjoyed Brandon because it seemed as though he was able to see the simple truth of the gospel and how it applied to his little church. So he has, every other week, President Carter teaches Sunday school at 10 o'clock. And then they have a service at 11. So one week, there'll be five to 600 people in his church. And then the other week, there'll be 30. And then five or 600, and then 30. And I said, so President Carter teaches Sunday school, so... Do they stay for, do they listen to you preach? How many of them stay to hear you preach? He said, well, President Carter is really smart. He tells people, I will gladly sit with, Rosalind and I will sit and we'll, you can come up to the front and we'll take pictures together with your family for as long as you need to after the service. <laughs> yes. so, so Brandon says they, the, the church sees it as like an outreach. Because you've got these visitors that come every other week, and so he's able to share the gospel every other week. And it's, uh, he was a delight to listen to. But what struck me was the importance he placed on communion and how it transformed the life of the body. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, in the following directives, I don't have any praise for you. I don't have any praise for you. So, so we drop here in the middle of 1 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 11. We haven't seen the first 10 chapters, but he's said a lot of stuff. And we drop into the middle of chapter 11, and he's saying, your meetings, your meetings in the area that I'm about to talk to you do more harm than good. You're coming together for the Lord's Supper. You're coming together for this love feast, for this communal meal, and they're actually you, it's actually better if you don't do it. He says in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. So socially and culturally, in every culture across the globe where believers meet together, the outside culture has divisions socially, economically, 
ethnically, uh, by gender, by, by all these ways that they will divide people into groups. And the gospel and Jesus, he eradicates all that. And he's saying that when you come together, you're importing the divisions that the world stamps on you, and you're just carrying them right into the church, not realizing that the very thing that you're celebrating, the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of Jesus, is the very thing that brings us all to the same level, and that gives us unity, and that gives us oneness, and that makes us one. And he says, to some extent, I believe it. Other other translations put that and I can't believe you're actually doing this. It's like, I, I can't, the gospel is so powerful and it's not what I taught you when I was there and I can't believe you're doing this. Verse 19, no doubt he's a little, he's, I, I don't know if he's ever snarky, but it seems like he might be a little snarky here. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it's not really the Lord's Supper you're eating. It's like, He's like, I know what the Lord's Supper is. I know what Jesus instituted in the upper room. And this really bears no resemblance to what Jesus was trying to do. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. Some of you are in the, the, the triclinium and you're eating well. And you're, you're actually, as a result, one person out here in the atrium remains hungry and another gets drunk. And Paul is saying, that's not how it is in the kingdom. That's not how it is in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, nobody goes hungry. In the body of Christ, everybody's needs are met because those who have more help those who have less. That Paul's saying, that's how it's, it is to be in the body of Christ. He says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? So... If the purpose is, if this is going to happen, he's saying, in the body, eat and drink in your homes, and then come together and have a common meal together. Share a common meal where everybody's eating the same thing. He says, because if you don't, you're going to be despising the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing. And the church of God here isn't some like nameless, faceless third party. It's the people, it's the people that are in the church. And in that day, again, you had had rich business owners and you had servants at the lowest level. And Paul's point was that the cross brings them together, even, right on the same level. Sometimes some of these reality TV shows, they'll take like normal people and then they'll take like Hollywood stars and they'll pair them together on a team, right? And then they'll make them do like really weird things and stuff that this, this really great Hollywood star has no more advantage than this normal person. That's what, that's what the gospel does. It brings the greatest and the smallest together under Christ, both in desperate need of him. So he says, you're humiliating those who have nothing. You're allowing the, the have-nots and the underprivileged to remain without and to stay without any privilege. And he says, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. So now we get to verse 23. So when I was a kid, we would uh, start at verse 23. So what if you started at verse 23 and you had no context? You would, I mean, you could just understand whatever you wanted to. You could start wherever you want to and have any kind of context, but that's not the way the scriptures are. And so with that as a context, you, you might as well not even do the Lord's Supper because you're allowing all the differences of the world to come right into your gathering. And in that gathering, all those differences should disappear. So he says in verse 23, I receive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, the night he was betrayed, he knows humiliation, he knows being a have not, he knows being on the outside in the atrium where you know the common people were. The night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body 
which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. There's a turn of phrase here in the, in the language the Bible was written in because what Paul is quoting is said three times in three of the Gospels. And he's pulling Jesus' words out of those Gospels, but he changes the order of them. Because in the Gospels, Jesus said, this is the body of mine. This is my body. And Paul puts the words in a different order. This of mine is the body. And what Paul is trying to do here is to show that this, that this suffering, that what was about to happen, that was imminent within, within hours, this, this body of his and this event that he was going to go through, this was for you. This suffering, this sacrifice is for you. And this, this of mine is what this bread represents, this suffering and this sacrifice. In the same way, in verse 25, it says, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, I'm going to turn, you don't have to turn, but it's in Exodus chapter 24. Exodus 24 is the shadow that this passage sits in. Because in Exodus 24, you, you, you've just been on the mountain, right, with the, with the thunder and the lightning, and the people are afraid, and they tell Moses, you go. You talk to God. We're afraid of him. We're not going to go or we're going to die. That, it's that context. And it says in verse 7 of Exodus 24, then he took the book of the covenant and he read it to the people. And they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. That fateful day, right? When Moses came with the law and he says, here, this is what God says. And they all said, we will obey. We're going to do what God says. Did they do it? Uh-uh. I mean, let's just say, did we do it? No, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. So God himself is going to come. Because back then, here's what it says. The next verse, verse 8, Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. This sacrifice, this blood, this blood from the sacrifice, he sprinkled on the people. He says, this is the blood of the covenant that you said you would keep. Today, this day, you said, we will do it, all these things we will obey. And what does Jesus say? He goes on and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. In my blood. This is a, the old covenant didn't work. And the blood of sacrifices wasn't sufficient. But this new covenant that's going to be in my blood, this is going to be sufficient. This is going to work. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This, this Lord's Supper called the Christ event, the love feast, the common meal, when you come together, I want you to commemorate and remember what it is that brings you together, what it is that binds you together, what it is that removes all the differences and all the distinctions from you and makes you one body. And that is the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 27, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now remember when I was a kid, I, I bet a lot of you experienced this. When you were a kid, you know, we had this time before we took the elements and we'd, we'd bow our heads and we'd, oh God, you know, I, I, we'd examine ourselves where we had this unconfessed sin and what, we didn't want, we didn't want to drink this cup. Our hands were shaking, you know, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a terrible, rotten sinner. I, I know that there's sins that I have and I can't remember them to confess them. I don't want to drink this. Then I'll fall asleep and I'll never wake up. I mean, this was the message that I got at 10 years old. But the context here, for, for those who, uh, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, in what Paul's saying, what his message is talking about in an unworthy manner, it's when you still, you come together as the body, you celebrate the very thing that breaks down all the walls and distinctions 
but you keep them up. You keep them up. Some go hungry, and some are fat and get drunk, and there's, there's this disparity, and it's humiliating to some. This is the unworthy manner. It's not some unconfessed sin as though the blood of Christ through our faith in Jesus can't take care of that. It's taking care of that. We have as believers, as believers, we have the righteousness of Christ. We have the righteousness of Christ. We don't have to walk around trembling about whether or not we've thought of a, of a sin to confess. We're to walk in the light, we're to walk in love, and we're gonna walk in the freedom that Jesus gives us. Galatians chapter five, right? Verse one, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Don't be, don't be uh, in bondage again by that, by that connection to the law as though that's what brought us righteousness. So they'll be guilty of sinning in an unworthy manner, we'll be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord, the very, the very reality that frees us and evens us out and unites us as one, that's what we're sinning against. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Before they have this, this Lord's Supper together, examine yourselves. Because, verse 29, those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ. Now Paul is using a, a, a double meaning here with this term. Without discerning the body of Christ. Without discerning, is there, is there love, is there unity? Am I thinking I'm better than somebody else? If I make more money and so I look down on this one or I've got more education so I look down on that one or, or, or I'm a certain uh, ethnicity and so I look down on the other ones or I'm a certain gender and I look down on the other one. Or in Christ, have we come together? Have we come together as one? Because those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, the brother, uh, the, the, the family of believers, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Some have interpreted this verse, verse 30, is that the very reality of a church body, a family that lives in a continuous disparity with the haves and the have-nots that remain, that allow the cultural distinctions to come right into the church, there are those who are, are dying and wasting away while others are, have plenty to eat. The same maladies that befall people out in the world with the world system that just follows them right into the church. It's not the people that are eating and drinking in an unworthy manner that are necessarily falling asleep, dying, being judged in that way. It's the people that aren't being taken care of. And some people are dying because they're not being taken care of. And it's a travesty in the church. I think that's a really interesting interpretation. And uh, one, that, one that, I'm, that I would consider as I look at this. Verse 31, but if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. And verse uh, 28 and 29 talk about that judgment. Verse 32, nevertheless, when we're judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not finally be condemned with the world. We don't want to be like the world. We're coming out of that. Jesus eradicates all those, all those um, prejudices and biases. Verse 33, so then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather together to eat, you should all eat together. None of this triclinium group and atrium group and maybe the outside servant quarters, none of this stuff. No, you all get together. Hey, if anything, the... The, the chiefs in the triclinium should come out to the atrium and say, oh, please, please, there's, there's good food in here. They should, because the Bible says when you humble yourself, God will exalt you, right? They should, they should be the servants and let others go first. That would be the spirit of Christ at play and at work within the body when they come together for the Lord's Supper. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. So, a few observations here that most that I've already that I've already covered. But the Corinthians, they really desecrated the Lord's Supper, not because they had unconfessed sin, but because as a body, they allowed all the distinction and prejudices from the culture come right in and be a part of what's going on in the room. The Lord's the Lord's Supper should intensify group solidarity and unity 
But for them, it highlighted their social and economic, their, their differences. And it should never have done that. Paul considers it uh, an abomination that some go hungry while others get drunk and eat like gluttons. That should not happen in the kingdom. Jesus erases the haves and the have-not distinctions. Those, those are, are to be gone. In the body, there should not be privileged and non-privileged. We're all forgiven and accepted sons and daughters, adopted by means of the undeserved shedding of Christ's blood on our behalf. The Lord's Supper for them needed to reveal the presence of Christ. Yet it looked, it looked just like a common pagan feast. And Paul says, no praise for you. If you remember, no soup for you, no praise for you. So this morning, we come as one body, the same, equal before God, in need of his grace and mercy, thankful for the sacrifices of Christ, the servant of all, and willing to be servants to one another, sacrificing even our own selves for one another's good. The Christ event, the love feast, this, um, what we have on the table, this extremely common meal, bread and juice. None of us is getting meat. None of us is getting wine. But we're all getting bread and juice. This extremely common meal unites us around what? Around the sacrifice of Christ. Christ.